By arrangement with Mr. Henry Reed and Mr. Donald Swan, we present Music Discrète, a request program of music by Dame Hilda Tablet. It, uh, it'll be a rather highbrow program. And here is Gabriel Hall Pollock, the music critic of Notes and Queries, to introduce it. Uh, good evening. There are certain moments, alas, all too rare, in the lives of all lovers of beauty when an ecstatic anticipation may run well nigh to fever pitch. And sitting in the studio here tonight, I have the exquisite pleasure of seeing before me Dame Hilda Tablet. Well, I'm not much to look at. Uh, surrounded by a goodly consort of music makers, vocal some, some instrumental. And why, I ask myself, are they here? And I answer myself in two words. They are here because these many months past, we have had insistent requests for a comprehensive survey, almost one might phrase it, a conspectus, of Dame Hilda's music. A coup d'oeil that shall give some impression total of her music's primal ingemination, its early inflorescence, and its final fructification. Do our task, then. One of our listeners, Mrs. Noreen Sharpley of Wincanton, Somerset, has written to ask, I have always wondered how Dame Hilda ever got on to music in the first place. Could you ask her? Now, perhaps you could answer that question, Dame Hilda. Well, I've sometimes wondered myself. I suppose the time when music began to claim me for her own must have been when I was at my last school, Berryvale, down in Mulset. It's a place I shall never forget. Its motto was written in wrought iron over the gates. For sanit haikolim meminisi juwabit. Juvabit, as we used to call it in those far-off days. The words come from the Oxford Dictionary of Quotations and mean your later life may be even worse. Well, Kisa, anyway, it was there at Verivale that reformatory zeal first inspired me. Perhaps the starting point was our dear old school song. It has often been said that England's school songs are among her chief musical glories. And who am I to deny it? Anyway, the words of the Berryvale school song were written by the headmistress, Miss Egmont. Miss Egmont was a true poet. Or so we were always assured by the senior English mistress, who was something of a masochist. She said what she meant by a true poet was that Miss Egmont always realized when... Under the stress of emotion, her own language was about to fail her. It was her invariable custom on these occasions to drop quickly into Latin. Then, when she'd pulled herself together, she would resume in English. But I gather you're turning on a bit of it any minute. Uh, the, yes, yes. Uh, three of our singers, uh, Miss Elsa Strauss, uh, Miss Gwendolyn Morgan Thomas, and Miss Brangwyn Brangwyn are going to sing two stanzas from this quite admirable piece d'occasion. Yeah. 
And who composed the music for that charming song, Dame Hilda? Well, uh, Miss Egmont claimed to have written that, too. And... Uh... I think it were better I express no opinion on the point. And I personally owe a great deal to Miss Egmont, if only by reaction. For we had a lot of music drummed into us at Berryvale. Beethoven, Brahms, Mozart, Schubert, Mendelssohn. Not very healthy stuff to give adolescent girls, some of them barely four foot high. But of course I'm speaking of a time when education took little account of psychology. Still, you appear to have come through unscathed, Dame Hilda. Yes, but I had character, you know. But many of the girls I knew then hadn't. Some of them have been quite incapacitated for normal life ever since. Yes. You see them to this day, propping up the bars of the women's clubs in Mayfair, humming, singing snatches of old tunes, the Ophelia complex, but there it was. The place was a hotbed. It was even rumoured that a certain amount of Tchaikovsky went on at weekends in the senior dormitory. Dear me. But if it did, thank God I never saw it. Let's leave the subject, shall we? Latin, we mentioned. We did a lot of Latin. And, of course, that influenced me, too. I said pretty well the whole of Catullus to music during my last year at school. In Latin or in English, Dame Hilda? In both. I worked over the text with a girlfriend called Lucy Peacock, who later married a Red Indian. Lucy and I were mad about Catullus. He's a girl's poet, of course. And like most lyric poets... Catullus is, as Lucy and I realized dimly even then, a bit on the effeminate side. Not that I hold it against anyone being effeminate. We can't all not be. Uh, no. But we always did feel Catullus needed a certain amount of virilization. Oh, yes. And I rather fancy we managed to supply that. Uh, really? Then yes, you know. mind you, we nearly got expelled for it when our homage to Catullus, as we called it, was finally performed at the Christmas concert. Still, it'll be interesting to hear it again, after all this lapse of time. You must remember, it's early stuff. I don't expect to be taken to task over it now. Oh, I am sure no one will do that, Dame Hilda. Well, so long as that's clear. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And the work has a certain originality and independence. A girl had to put up a pretty game struggle, not to drift into the diatonic stupor the rest of the school mooned about in. Our top form was even called the Major Sits, God help us. But I think I can claim that you'll find jolly little trace of the Beethoven Brahms gang in this little number, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, the homage to Catullus will be sung by Miss Brangwin Brangwin and Miss Ilse Strauss. Oh, I 
Thank you, Mr. Mm, who is it, for your discreet piano accompaniment. Ta. Well, of course, it's damnably diatonic. But, oh, well, at least it's clean and it's young and it's wholesome and original. No lobby Ludwig there. By golly. No. Uh, no, no. Well, that setting of a great Roman author is, of course, a far cry from your later settings of classical poets, Dame Hilda. I should say so. Now, we have had a request from... Uh, Mrs. Elizabeth J. Hamilton of Lower Trotham, Gloucestershire, for your well-known setting, dating only from 1955, of Sappho's The Moon Has Set. Well, that's awfully nice of Mrs. Elizabeth J. Hamilton. Who is she? Well, she... Uh, it's a request <laughs> that's been sent in. Okay. Come on, Elsa. I'll oblige you at the piano myself this time. <laughs> Kemena Selana Kepleiades Messa de Nuptas Parader Ego de Mona Catido Thank you, Miss Strauss. Uh, thank you, Dame Hilda. And thank you, Mrs. Hamilton, for your postcard requesting this well-loved piece. I don't know why you call it well-loved. People have had no chance to love it. That was only its second performance on the so-called third program in four and a half years. Well, let us hope it won't have to wait so long for its third performance, Dame Hilda. No, I'm seeing to that. We're giving the third performance straight away. Quick, Elsa, ready? <laughs> Come on, come on, come on. Ego de Mona Catito. There. <laughs> Sorry, dear. I always forget that bit. Well, I think honor is satisfied. Thank you, Miss Strauss, and thank you, Dame Hilda. I don't think that... you need thank Mrs. Hamilton again. She only asked for it the once. Oh. Well, what next? Some of our correspondents have noted, Dame Hilda, that your attitude to your contemporaries has given the impression of sometimes verging on, or shall we say, approaching the almost uh, contemptuous. Well, why not? Uh, no, uh, my point, Dame Hilda, is that I think people have disregarded the many encouraging things you have said about other living composers. When? Well, Dame Hilda, no one who heard it would ever forget the moving tribute you broadcast on the Northern European Overseas Network on the occasion of the 90th birthday of the late Jean Sibelius. I would like to play a little of it for listeners. Yes, do, by all means. I think I can legitimately claim that anything Sibelius can do stark, I can do starker. That, I feel I have to say. On the other hand, I freely admit that this grand old man is 90. And above all, there's one thing I would like to stress, which I think is always to be borne in mind whenever we have to listen to Sibelius's music. And this is it. 
The music of Sibelius is never so bad as it sounds. I'm all for it. Uh, I said that, did I? Well, of course, one mellows with the years. Or at any rate, one becomes more tolerant. I'm... I'm glad I said it. Uh, you have even been heard to speak favorably, on at least one occasion, of the music of Richard Strauss, Dame Hilda. And I'd do so again, damn it. Why not? I was listening to Strauss's four last songs the other night, and it suddenly came over me that when all said and done, these four songs are quite as good as the four Indian love lyrics in their way. Now, let's face it, boys... It's pretty well the same way, isn't it, now? Uh, yes. And would you care to make any comment on the music of Stravinsky, Dame Hilda? Stravinsky? Igor Stravinsky, you mean, of course? Uh, yes. Well, yes. He's uh, always there, isn't he? Uh, yes. He's always there. Any more of them? Well, uh, of course, uh, there are our own English composers, Born Williams, for example. Yes. Well, of course, he's no longer with us, is he? Ah, no, no. And uh, Sir William Walton? He, on the other hand, of course, still is. Mm. Yes. And finally, Dame Hilda, would you care to say anything about Mr. Benjamin Britten? Who? I would like us now to turn our attention to the influence of foreign travel upon Dame Hilda's work. Many listeners have sent in questions about this, though some of them have even offered suggestions about where Dame Hilda might care to go next. And unquestionably, the beauties of the foreign scene have moved composers no less than they have moved poets and painters. We may perhaps be forgiven for thinking that by now the romantic gorges and castles and lakes and rivers of Italy and Switzerland have had their day, the day of Liszt and Berlioz. <laughs> and what a day... <laughs> But there are worlds elsewhere. And Dame Hilda, as we know, has ever been deeply drawn to North Africa. We have learned that it was during one of her many sojourns in the prismatic kaleidoscope of Marrakesh that Dame Hilda heard a piece of music of which we shall now play you a recording. Listeners to the third program will, of course, need no introduction to the music of North Africa, uh, nor it to them. But one summer night in 1946... In the old bazaar of Marrakesh, this is what Dame Hilda heard. I, uh, wasn't Dame Hilda in those days, you know. Uh, no, I, uh... I was just simple Miss Tablet. Uh, yes, I should perhaps have said that. Just simple little Miss Tablet. Yes. That was me. This, then, was the music, so redolent of its locale, so exuberantly pregnant with the colourful life about it, that little Miss Sampler... Uh, uh, tib uh, tab oh, dear... Zakir tu mahabani, ya habibi, shilti gelpi shemari. Ping, 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 ping. Ya habibi, kabila alpati, yam kanat wazifti nabaki. And what were your first reactions to that strange new music, Dame Hilda? Well, uh, I was jolly surprised. And the second hearing? I was even more surprised. Uh, but you heard it yet again? Yes, several times. It seemed to be the only piece they knew. About the eighth time round, poor old Elsa insisted we should leave. She was convinced she'd picked up a flea. Uh, um, yes. Um... I never mind them myself, but Elsa's Austrian, and you know how clean they like to keep themselves. I have told you 500 times, Hilda, it was worse than a flea. It was a bug. Well, it may have been a bug by Austrian standards. 
But by English standards, it was a mere flea. But a bug is not just a large flea, oh, Hilda. I knew we should have this. It was a bug. It was full of my own blood. Uh, yes, 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 yes. yes. Uh, and what influence do you think that music may have had on your subsequent work, Dame Hilda? None whatever. But thank you for asking. I think this establishes an interesting point. We know that there are two ways in which a composer may be influenced by folk music. He may, like Bartok and Vaughan Williams, take whole tunes and incorporate them in his own work, uh, demonstrating them, as it were. And there is the second way, which uh, we may compare to the manufacture of yogurt. <laughs> in this process, as every housewife knows, the wild yogurt culture is placed in ordinary milk. And after a time, the milk is observed to have absorbed the yogurt and to have turned into yogurt, as it were. Carl Nielsen is a composer who springs to mind in this connection. Yes. And I think we shall find that Dame Hilda's next phase shows yet a third effect that folk music may have. Namely, that the experience may indicate to a composer precisely what to avoid. This may seem a surface judgment, merely... Nonetheless, if we examine Dame Hilda's work very deeply, we shall, I think, find that it has survived the impact of North African folk music quite unblemished. Now, I am going to ask a, a critic from the younger generation, uh, Mr. Angel Bish, uh, music critic of the numismatist, uh, to talk about Dame Hilda's later work. We have had a request from Mrs. Uh, D. M. Swancourt of Ashford, Kent, for Dame Hilda's 15th Quintet, and it is about this work that Mr. Bish will mainly talk. Naturally, as with most composers, we find that Dame Hilda tablets preoccupations with the great problems of life, such as death, suffering, etc., are ever reflected in her work. And like other composers, it is in her chamber works that she lays bare to us her uh, most intimate feelings. It is fairly well known that the death of a favourite horse in 1943 is the inner springboard, as it were, for the second movement of her twelfth quintet. The deaths of three other horses very shortly after are reflected in the slow movement of quintets numbers 13, 14 and 15, belonging to the same year. It was a damn bad year for horses, 1943. Uh, I, uh, yes, Dame Hilda. It was the food we were all getting at the time, I expect. It was enough to kill anybody. That second horse was terrible. Uh, yes. But uh, do go on. And in the... Uh, but actually, you're wrong about quintet 15. The horse in that one actually got better. I hoped I'd made that clear. You see, the music, though deadly serious for a lot of the time, does perk up quite a bit as it goes off. That is the one you're going to give them, isn't it? Oh, uh, yes. A thing worth remarking on about these later chamber works is their extreme concision. Darius Mio has written symphonies lasting only four or five minutes, but Dame Hilda has managed to reduce this record to three minutes, 40 seconds. In this minuscule space, she has shown us some of the greatest heights and depths that music has scaled and plumbed respectively. It is perhaps not too much to say that they represent the most searching and profound chamber works written since the great final quartet... Careful, of... careful! Uh, pardon. Don't say anything you're going to be ashamed of tomorrow morning, will you? Well, here is the quintet number 15 for percussion and strings. Uh, the work is headed... To Dear Old Dobbin by Edward II out of Daisy Miller. The first movement is marked Allegro and Fatico. <laughs> interrupted threnody is in a normal or almost normal romancer form. 
written as an inscription at the beginning of the movement, are the lines of W.B. Yeats. Too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. Good. Uh, the movement is marked Adagio e Come, and leads gradually into a demi-scherzo in the form of a galoppo. last movement, which requires little in the way of formal analysis, is marked Andante con moto, ma non troppo moto, solo un poco, capito? Here, if anywhere, do we find recaptured that sublime sense of a slowly renascent giant energy, also found in the Lydian slow movement in the A minor quartet of... Ow, 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 ow. I, I... Here is the last movement. The note of satire on which it begins is, if harsh, in no wise uncharitable. Perhaps be those who say... Hmm? Shut up.
perhaps be those who say that such music is music for the few. For the happy few, indeed. Its drama is intimate and deep. But the wider claims of drama have never been neglected by Dame Hilda. Of the lovely peaks of her operatic work, this is not the place to speak. But Dame Hilda is also a great collaborator. She was one of the pioneers of that great aid to theatric illusion known as music concrete. Uh, that, I think, is true, Dame Hilda? Yes, of course. Though, as you know, I like a distinction to be drawn between ordinary music concrete and my own musique concrète renforcée. By uh, renforcée, I wish to indicate that the tonal texture is laced with little two or three note motives of my own composition. Laced, did you say, Dame Hilda? Yes, the way some people lace draft bitter with rum, you know. Uh, oh, yes. Or gin, even. And, of course, you can also lace stout with champagne, if you like. Or champagne with Grand Marnier, or Grand Marnier Yes, we with... would very much like to... Uh... Oh, the prospects are endless, almost. Yes, we would very much like to know how you first, uh, to use a vulgarism, got on to the idea of music concrete, Dame Hilda. Well, believe it or not, but my starting point was a passage I read from the prose writings of a French composer by the name of Bizet. I suppose he's pretty well forgotten by now, except to musicologists. But he attempted to write an opera based on Mary May's novel, Carmen. A subject I've sometimes thought of coping with myself. However, now, though you've only to glance through one of Bizet's musical scores to realize that he was mentally subnormal, he did, when not composing, have occasional lucid intervals. The passage I've copied out is quite a short one. Suppose you read it to us, little Mr. Bish. You read so... Frightfully beautifully. Oh, thank you, Dame Hilda. Uh, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you. Okay. Well, go on. Uh, Bizet says, we have the music of the future, the music of the present, and the music of the past. Then there is philosophical and ideological music, melodic music, harmonic music, learned music, the most dangerous of all. And finally, a state-patented brand of canon music, Tomorrow, we shall have needle music and screw music, force pump music and double force pump music. This last above all. You can stop there, Tar. Well, the difficulty was, of course, for a girl to find out just exactly what the sweet hell of double force pump actually was, as it were. Well, I found out. A force pump is, quote, a pump employed to force water, etc., beyond the range of atmospheric pressure, unquote. And so a double force pump is much the same thing, only it does it twice. So I got one. We shall hear now an example of Dame Hilda's music concrete or renforcé in action on the stage. This recorded passage is from a production of Antony and Cleopatra at Stratford-upon-Avon a few years ago. The production had many novel features. Uh, notably, to underline the universality of the conflict, the play was produced in Napoleonic costumes. The parallel between the fated Egyptian pair on the one hand and Lord Nelson and Lady Hamilton on the other was well brought out. And a new and definitive light was cast on the character of Edo Barbus, of whom the producer, Mr. Neville Pikelet, uh, has written, I see him as a sort of Beau Brummel. In this production, the play opened with Ina Barbus's famous barge speech. Now, here it is, with Dame, then Miss Hilda Tablet's music concrete renforcé as its accompaniment. The barge she sat in, like a burnished throne, burned on the water. The poop was beaten gold, purple the sails. And so perfumed that the winds were lovesick with them. The oars were silver, 
which to the tune of flutes kept stroke. And made the water which they did beat to follow faster as amorous of their strokes. For her own person, it beggared all description. lie in her pavilion, cloth of gold of tissue, or picturing that Venus where we see the fancy outwork nature. On each side her stood pretty dimpled boys, like smiling cupids, with divers colored fans whose wind did seem to glow the delicate cheeks which they did cool. And what they undid, <laughs> did. Card from Mrs. R. Gertrude Fosway of North Allerton, County Durham, requesting some example of your work in progress. The inquisitiveness of some people knows no bounds, does it? Oh, Dame Hilda, I feel... Yeah, I mean, it just doesn't, does it? Uh, well, of course. <laughs> we all know that an artist must have his secret life with his oeuvre until the oeuvre is ready to join the stream of public history. <laughs> But we all know, too, that you are engaged on a new opera on the subject of Lysistra. I can't think how that news got out. Is it true that you're writing your own libretto on this occasion? Well, I more or less have to. You know how it is these days. Uh, would you care to elaborate that point, Dame Hilda? Not much, no. Uh, you are not collaborating with your former librettist, Mr. Harold Reith, on this new project? No. And why is that, Dame Hilda? Well, I have to say it. But though Mr. Harold Reith and I are still tremendous friends, there was a sort of break between us some time ago. A little rupture. And of course, if a chap honestly and sincerely prefers mousing about the espresso bars of the Fulham Road wearing four thick sweaters and a dirty old damn great duffel coat, instead of staying at home working quietly away at a girl's libretto like any normal person, then it's perfectly okay by me. Perfectly okay. And so the fragment we're about to hear has words by yourself, Dame Hilda. Yes, mind you, they're still in a pretty tentative state. Oh, yes, yes, we appreciate that, Dame Hilda. Yes, and you will appreciate also that I haven't yet quite settled what language it's to be in. Oh. It's rather like dear old Miss Egmont again, I suppose. I've written a good deal of the libretto in German, the natural language for opera. At the same time, German isn't a very subtle language. And the occasional poignancy and, uh, well, subtlety of the ideas seem to me to go more naturally in English. Well, that's the state it's in at the moment. I'm afraid that people like Mrs. R. Gertrude Fosway of North Allerton may be a little disillusioned when they see the strange things we creative artists get up to in our endeavour to get whatever's inside of us out. But there it is. The general idea, I understand, Dame Hilda, in the fragment we're about to hear, is that it is a bakingly hot summer night in Athens. Yes, and I thought of see the bakingly hot summer night sort of enshrined in the orchestra, partly represented here by the piano. Uh, could you shove a bit further along on the stool, please, Mr. Then I might be able to... Ta. And, of course, the bakingly hot summer night is dominated by the song of the nightingale, as in the time of Sophocles. And there's uh, all this nightingale, and it's baking hot, you know, and that sort of thing. Yes, yes. And these two women, you know, like Sister Ter and what's her name who won't have anything to do with their husbands because of the war, they're lying awake in bed and chatting. Troubled, you know. There's a certain troubled quality about it all. And oh, it's all boiling up. I feel I have to get the atmosphere right. The bakingly hot summer night. It really does get very warm in the summer out there. And then there's this dominating, rather aggressive nightingale, you know. Keeps 
popping up. You know how they do. Oh, well, ready? It begins with a sort of prelude.
a lyrical chunk now. them do after. It's one of those problems every musician finds himself faced with daily. It'll sort itself out, of course, but at the moment I just can't quite see how. There they all are, garbing away. I can't, as it were, get them down. If Mrs. R. Goethe's Fosway of North Allison has any little suggestions to offer, perhaps she could just drop me another of those postcards of hers. Why not? That ends Musique Discrète, a request program of music by Dame Hilda Tablet. The script was supplied by Henry Reed, the music by Donald Swan, with additional instrumentation by Max Saunders. The program was produced by Douglas Cleverton. This was the cast. Dame Hilda Tablet, Mary O'Farrell, Gabriel Hall Pollock, Derek Guyler, Angel Bish, Derek Jacobi, Ina Barbas, Dennis Quilly, who also sang the Algerian song.